everybody can see does it say chapter two general housekeeping items yeah okay yep yep Great. So uh, these are these are housekeeping items that that uh, that we had when we did our for DS. Uh, we're well, I mean, I suppose we're welcome to keep them here for this book club, or or you can ignore them. It doesn't matter. But um, what I just put out here is that this is a learning opportunity. So feel free to ask any question at any time. You can interrupt me. Um, and that's no problem. Um, I don't think that there's any question that's too small. Um, I, I tend to go a little bit fast because I feel like it's easier to slow to slow me down rather than ask me to speed up. And so if I do need to slow down, by, by all means, just stop and, and ask the question. Uh, one thing that I also recommend here is to take time to learn the theory and rather than just the code per se. Um, this this a ggplot generally centers around the grammar of graphics and that's a um a, a white paper by that name so if you haven't already it might take time to actually read through that and helps you understand the theory of this a little bit better um i think it's useful and then please do the chapter exercises that's the second best learning opportunity and also please plan to facilitate one of the discussions because it's the best learning opportunity all right so with that being said then um Everybody, I think, is familiar with the ggplot book. And if we look next at the learning objectives here, it's a this chapter is really just a brief introduction to ggplot's capabilities. And we learn about the key components that every data plot or every plot has, which is the data that's involved that you're actually plotting, the aesthetics, which um, you'll get familiar with in just a second. But this is um, to kind of summarize it. It's the way that the the different variables in the data set get uh, show up in the plot and then there's genomes which are which is the actual depiction of what um, of, uh, like a bar or a line or, or whatever so obviously we'll get into these in a little bit more detail just now we'll also learn about faceting we'll see a few different genomes we'll modify the axes and then save the plot to disk um, if we get to it all all right so in this chapter, chapter two, we mainly use the MPG data set that comes with ggplot. And you can see what it looks like here as a sample it has these columns, manufacturer, model, dis, uh, displacement, year, cylinder, trans, drive, city, highway, um, FL, which I can't remember what that is, um, and then class. Um, some definitions here are below. It, uh, a city and highway is the mileage in miles per gallon. And the displacement is the engine displacement in liters, front wheel drive, the model of the car, and then class is like a two seater or an SUV or compact or whatever. Okay. So if you'll just keep in mind that this is what the data is, um, it's, it's car information. And generally, it's the, it's the city mileage and the highway mileage, uh, along with some other variables there. Okay. to chapter five then of um chapter five is of this presentation not of the book i should clarify that um so off to on to this section here which talks about the components of every plot so as you make the plots in ggplot they'll all begin with the with the function ggplot and then those three components that we talked about earlier data aesthetics and geome come in later so within the ggplot function will include the data. And so as we talked about, we're looking at the MPG data set here. And so that will be the that will be the data argument for ggplot so that so we know what data we're actually working with. And then the next portion is AES and it stands for aesthetic. And on a on a two dimensional plot, there will be an x axis and a y axis. And in this particular case, we wanted to measure or, or plot the displacement along the x-axis and the highway mileage along the y-axis. And because these are, are variables that are being mapped to an axis, um, they're not in quotation marks. They reference the column name themselves, and it gets, it gets mapped that way. And I'll talk a little bit more about mapping in just a second. And then lastly, we want this to be a point or a scatter plot um, for our purposes. A scatter plot is referred to as geom underscore point. And so with these three components and the functions associated, you can put them in here in the code like it is here, and you end up with a scatter plot like we anticipated with the displacement along the x axis, the highway mileage along the y axis, 
And then each of the observations is a point in, in the plot. Okay. Any questions so far? So new, has everyone had some experience creating these plots? I don't know if you, you know, if you followed the chapter, then you would have maybe used this exact same data set, MPG. Everybody good? Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, there's a final note here at the bottom that it is allowable to omit the X and the Y arguments of AES. So in other words, AES displacement and highway would be valid for this plot, uh, meaning that this X and this Y can be uh, omitted. All right. Moving on then to a few exercises. So, uh, uh, so this one, the book asks, what does the below plot show and is it useful and how could it improve? And I'll let somebody answer that question in a, in a few minutes um, as soon as I go through this. So, so once again, we're still using the MPG data set. In this case, we've mapped the model variable to the X axis and the manufacturer variable to the Y axis. And we're again still using a scatter plot, geome point. And this down here just allows for some clarity with these labels down here. And because otherwise they would have been written horizontally and they would overlap. So, um, so it's, it's okay to sort of ignore this last part. But, um, but you can see here that we've now created the model on the X axis and the manufacturer on the Y axis with the, each of these points representing a, um, a car a manufacturer in a car model combination. So anyone have any input on, on what the plot, whether the plot is useful or how it could improve? Thoughts? I don't think this plot is all that useful. It doesn't um, really convey any other information than you can get by just looking at the data themselves. Um, I think it'd be more useful to get like an overall summary of just like a histogram or not a histogram, but like a bar chart maybe of the number of vehicles within each manufacturer, but yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and, and scatter plot may not be the best way to present this for sure. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Kenton. I think if this is showing the models for each manufacturer, just a table would be a better presentation probably. Doesn't seem like it really lends itself to a visual display like this. Yeah. Yeah, you can get this information off of a website, really. Right. So. Yeah, I agree. So I think what this really presents is um, which model has which car. This not really a model. Yeah, so this would be, you know, most likely always one dot. So it just shows that, uh, you know, like a one-to-one -one mapping kind of a thing, which mm -hmm. could be useful maybe in some other cases. So I think the, the, the point that I'm trying to drive is that these two X and Y are categorical variables. I think one thing important to note, which in which case scatter plot is not, uh, you know, it's not representing enough information. However, like one thing that could be useful, I'm um, now that we, you showed this, I, I was starting to think, if we had multiple models by one, um, would you say by the one by one manufacturer? Mm -hmm. uh, or wait, let me see. Let me rephrase my question. My thought. So, if one there were multiple entries, let's say of one model for each manufacturer. Um. Okay, I think I I don't know how to put it in the right words, but I think yeah. if there were multiple records in, from the data point of view, if there were multiple records for each manu uh, manufacturer and then we were what we are representing in inside within points uh, like within the scatter plot if, if it was you know that big or small bubble or you know that size uh, of the point was showing me something i think that could be one way useful information uh, but not as is yeah i completely agree so we're missing any kind of of a dimension to show us that there's maybe there's a lot of uh, of nissan Altimas, or and maybe only a few Pontiac Grand Prix, but we it's just right now it's just one dot for every um, for every instance and it doesn't tell us too much. Uh, but you mentioned an interesting thing about the, the x and the y axis, both of these being categorical variables. And if you if if that's a new term, let me know. But um, but. It, I think it's it's probably pretty well understood that a scatter plot is probably not the most 
the best way to represent um, two categorical variables. At least there are other options to explore. Um, it, so anyway, yeah, uh, and, and I guess that means that, go, that, that goes to the point that every kind of plotting display there, there might be like an ideal way to display those. Like maybe you have a continuous variable and a categorical, or maybe it's two continuous variables or um, whatever it is. I think there tends to be a, a preferred way to display that. Um, Ryan, would that be like saying like a, like a scatter plot as a geome wouldn't represent categorical data correctly, but if we maybe used a bar chart instead? Uh, I don't even know if a histogram would work, but yeah. I'm trying to think of, of a different way to represent the amount of vehicle types within the manufacturer itself and use that as a bar chart that would give us some scale on who is a larger uh, manufacturer of vehicle models versus, uh, uh, you know, a smaller single like Land Rover only having one uh, uh, model type. Yeah, yeah. And, and I don't know that there's a a hard and fast rule for all of it. Um, it probably comes down to usage and preference a little bit, but um, yeah, just depending on, on on the inputs and the type of variables that are input, I think there tends to be a, a preferred or a, a small group of preferred ways to display that. Um, and I just go back to, to one instance, this is years ago at work. Um, so I, I work in the logistics industry and I had a colleague who presented uh, tracking numbers like shipment tracking numbers and uh, on a line graph so the x-axis was every was all the tracking numbers and then there was a line that showed information about them but there was no reason to present those as a, as a line graph there's no progression from one shipment tracking number to the next and so a line graph doesn't really lend itself to what uh, to what that colleague wanted to present so um so i don't know maybe scatter plot could work in this case if you wanted to mess around with it a little bit or or maybe not so Good. Right. Then um, let's see. So practice coding the following plots. Anticipate what the output would look like. And become familiar with the common components of the plot. Um, so this is MPG. In this case, we're doing two continuous variables, city miles per gallon and highway miles per gallon. So that um, that's uh, one, one other way of presenting that. This uses a different data set called diamonds, where you capture the carrot on one axis and the price on the other. Again, it's being shown as a scatter plot. Um, and then here's another one called economics, where it's plotting date and unemployment. And this is using a line. So, you know, time series tend to work better for, or line graphs tend to work better for time series. So, so that was chosen for this one. And then here's a histogram using city miles per gallon from the MPG data set. So um, it, hopefully if you're, if you're not familiar with these, you can see that in every case we are getting those three components. Um, there's always gonna be a data set, there's always gonna be an aesthetic portion, and there's always going to be a geome that's set, okay? Okay, let me know if you have any questions, otherwise, We'll move on to the next one, chapter seven. So there's other aesthetic attributes too. So besides just the X and the Y being part of the aesthetic, we can include other things like color, shape, size, and a number of other things as well that can be mapped to variables in the data. And this is the important point about, uh, about arguments that go inside of the aesthetic is that they get mapped to variables in the data. So contrast being mapped to a variable in the data, contrast that with actually saying what you want that, uh, that aesthetic to be. Like um, it's like a, a static value versus a, a constant value versus a variable. Hopefully that'll be clearer in just a second here. Um, in the class variable of the MPG data set, there's seven unique values. So the plot can assign a specific color to each value by mapping class to color within the aesthetic function. Okay, so here's the seven values under class. And if we include color here as uh, mapped to the class, it's an additional uh, argument within the aesthetic. Then you can see that once we plot these out, each of those classes gets assigned to a color and it gets 
um, and, it, and it gets uh, displayed that way. Let me see if I can make this point a little bit clearer. The fact that we're putting this inside of the aesthetic and, uh, and we're using a variable here means that ggplot is actually going to go in and assign a color to each class that, the, that it finds in the data. Uh, and then it's going to display it here. Alternatively, um, there's ways to just specify a, a blanket color for everything here um, without, without it being influenced by the actual values in the class variable. Does anybody have any questions on that? Or would anybody like to try to explain what I'm explaining a little bit better? Give it another swing. I actually have, have a question, Ryan. So how's this different from using the fill argument there? Because I could use the same argument and the result would be basically the same yeah. so i got to pounce that different shape that you use so like mm -hmm. I, I forget what the default shape it might be it might be 21 but like some of those shapes don't some of the shapes you can you can color one color which will you know fill it but then if you say um there's other shapes where if you add map um data to the the color aesthetic it'll just color the outline of the shape and fill will be a separate color Oh yes, yeah. Sure yeah, that makes sense. Is so if you would test, uh, so some so plot. If this is the germ point, this like you said, fill and group color would be same. But if you did this same difference, I mean, if you ran the fill and color differently for uh, distribution or for um, bar chart, you would see the difference. So fill is going to fill inside of the bar chart, but color would only color the outline border of the bar chart. So um, it kind of is a little tricky, not, not a very straightforward difference, but it helps understand with, with bar chart and, you know, more uh, charts with bigger area, uh, that really helps. Yeah, it does make sense now. Yeah. Obviously, the help can, it can inform all the different aesthetics that can be assigned and probably um, share, shed a little bit of light on what they actually do as well. So, okay. Anyone else? Yeah, I think you described it um, pretty perfectly. I think maybe one more thing to notice, I, I actually didn't read the chapter, so I'm not sure if they go into this later in this chapter or another one, but it's like this concept of um, kind of inheritance or maybe not in like a strict sense, but if we you know, map the class variable to the color aesthetic in the main ggplot function call, um, that applies then to all of the subsequent geoms. So not just the first one or the second one. And I think that's important to note if you start, if you think you have a plot or an idea for a plot in your head and then it doesn't necessarily translate, I think that's definitely um, one of the potential issues that you can kind of figure out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That, that's good. That's good to point out because I was gonna ask you uh, why we didn't put the color argument inside GM point because usually that would be like, I mean, what Stan is pointing out, right? So if you want just this scatter plot to be colored by class, so you, you would put the argument there. But if you put inside the ggplot function, then yeah, like Stan said, it goes to all the other gems. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's, it's not addressed in this particular chapter, but yes, as you said, let's say you have one layer that you're gonna use as geom point and then another layer that's geom bar right afterwards, then uh, I hope this is right. If it's not, just just say something. But if you put color here uh, associated with ggplot, then it's going to map color class here in geom point and in geom bar. Otherwise, you can put it just in geom point, and then it only applies at the geom point, and then then you can manipulate the geom bar elsewhere. I'm sure this is addressed in different chapters. Um, it just wasn't in this one, but yeah, yeah maybe, I, uh, maybe I jumped the gun on that. No, no, it's all good. No, I, I think I, what you did is actually just volunteer for that chapter. No, I'm just kidding. So <laughs> maybe I, if I can find it, I will, uh, I'll take it. Just one clarification. If you change that to fill equals class, it actually will plot black with the default shape because that shape doesn't support the fill aesthetic. Mm -hmm. There are some, somebody said some of the point shapes do support both color and fill, but not the default shape. 
Yeah, exactly, Kent. Thanks for, for clarifying. I think the default is, is 21, but there's a website where I, I don't even know how many different like different point shapes there are, probably yeah. I don't know, a couple dozen. So yeah, if you do help on line type, you get a couple of ways to display the various line types and shapes both. Um, I was gonna do it real quick, but I, I'll skip it. Good. Everybody good? All right, yep. so, so we're talking about aesthetics still and, and whether we map different variables to different aesthetics here. Um, putting it inside of the aesthetic is the key to actually having it map. You can also put the aesthetic outside of the aesthetic, um, including a color assignment outside the aesthetic of the geometry layer will make all points, all of the points that color. So, so here we're putting it we're, we're not putting it inside the aesthetic. If we had, we would put AES here first and then, and then this information. But, but we haven't included it as part of an aesthetic under geome point. We're just specifying color blue. And so it makes everything blue. Okay. Hopefully you can draw the contrast here between putting it inside the, of the aesthetic where it maps to the, to the values in that column and putting it outside the aesthetic and um, and then it's just as like more of a literal value. I have a question. Yes. And I, sorry, I kind of blanked out um, before when you guys were having the other discussion. But yeah. um, so within aesthetic, so the first two are the actual variables that are being plot. And then like when you had color class, it changed the color of the dots for class. So could you potentially put, um, I'm not sure all the variables that can go within aesthetic, uh, maybe um, was it PCH which changes like the the actual dot and stuff like that. Um, I don't know if that's for um, these type of plots, but could you put then another categorical va variable to then add another like layer of um, just changing it up as well within aesthetic? Yes, you absolutely can. So you can put as as many as actually apply. Um, into these aesthetics and then yeah you'll just continue to adjust these so go ahead anybody else if you go to the help for the individual geoms it will give a list of the aesthetics supported by that and geom point does have both shape and size so you could definitely map shape to another categorical variable and size is either categorical or continuous okay yeah. sounds good thank you Ken, do you mind if I expand on that statement? So no, is, it, go ahead. is it proper to state that our aesthetic uh, color code should be some level of categorical value? Because uh, if we go continuous, wouldn't you potentially start to reuse RGB values or, or some kind of a color code value no, over again? It, it'll actually use a different scale. It'll use a continuous scale. And the default, I think, is um, like a light to dark blue. Yeah, I, so I, it maps it into a color scale, a, a continuous scale rather than a discrete scale. Yeah, there's an example. That's perfect. Thank you. A continuous variable. And then um, Lydia, to go back to your question, oops, went too far here. Um, this next. Um, example here, we see that we have put shape gets mapped to to the DRV column, and color also does. So there are four, there are three values under drive, four wheel drive, front wheel drive, and rear wheel drive, and so we've we've mapped that to both a shape and a color. And now you can see all of the triangles are green, all of the circles are red, and all the squares are blue. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah, I didn't, I didn't finish the chapter. I started, but I didn't finish it yet. Yeah, no worries. So, um, yeah, so, and, and I, I don't know, I, I assume that if you start lining up five and six and seven different mappings, maybe it becomes either redundant or unintelligible. So it's probably a little bit of an art there to getting just the right number. Um, all right, so good. So then we want to, another way to look at it is to map a variable to, to size can also add some new insights here. So, um, so we're using the MPG again. Aesthetic is now manufacturer and, and drive. 
and then size is, a, is assigned to the displacement. Okay. So now you can see that these, these dots take on different sizes based off of the, um, the total displacement. Okay. So I, could, I suppose we could also maybe put in, like on this one, map something else, map displacement to size, and then you'll have like, you know, big green triangles and small blue squares and big blue squares. Anyway, you get the idea. All right, good. Move on to the next one then. Yep. So faceting. Faceting creates graphics by splitting the data into subsets and displaying the same graph for each subset. It's really helpful if there are lots of values making color and shape less meaningful. So in this case, we are adding a facet wrap associated to class. We saw it before where class was assigned to color. Right, everything's on the same graph, and each class is assigned its own color. But maybe it gets a little bit unintelligible there, and so, um, and so you can use this facet wrap approach and break each out, each one out, um, to its own graph. And now you can see how those how those different variables interact within each uh, which within each value there. Okay. So not faceted by so the, uh, the next exercise is to use faceting to explore the three-way relationship between fuel economy, engine size, and number of cylinders. Okay. So here it is not faceted by cylinder. And then the next one is you see that it is faceted by cylinder. So it's hard to make it out using this if it's not faceted, but then by faceting it, you can see that um, four cylinders five cylinders six cylinders and eight cylinders hey ryan as a as a whole ggplot book club uh, i i want to ask a rhetorical question to the team is it just me or does anybody else go a little bit crazy when they see faceted uh, graphs my brain has a difficulty in comprehending what exactly it's doing with all these smaller subsets of, of graph like i have to pause and and kind of it's it's like creating multiple instances all in one page or all in one object uh, with these different graphs. But if you combine them together, it would represent the graph above. Am I the only one that may be a little crazy and, and when we facet things and, and it starts to get a little uh, uh, difficult to comprehend what your data is telling you within that one facet? I. I kind of share that sentiment as well. And I guess in my work, like in some of these instances where you facet, you have to use like the scales equals free argument, because if not, um, some of the categor categorical variables have very wildly different distributions. And if you put them all in the same scale, it looks very, very funky. But then again, when you add them on a free scale and they're, they all look somewhat normal, but you have to keep looking at the X and Y axes to kind of make sense of what's going on. So I, I definitely agree with that. But I think in some instances, maybe where I just want to present like a few cases, it, it makes sense. Um, but that I guess that's kind of how I see it. I, I don't think I would really use faceting for much else, maybe besides some exploratory work, but I agree. There's it does, a, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of examples where uh, even on, on online help forums or even in some of our books where they start to break out facets. And then as soon as I stumble into those uh, conversation or those topics, my, my brain goes a little crazy trying to comprehend what that small graph is representing in relation to the, to the argument that we're passing. Um, it could just be me though. I, I it may be, uh, uh, I wanted to find out if anybody else has that same attribute or not. I guess what, what, what the main problem for me actually is the problem is scale and the axis. Because when you, when you facet stuff, if, if you don't like show me the proper scale, like is it the same scale or is just like Stan said, it's just free scale for everything that I'm seeing right now or if you have like different axes or like different labels for the axes. So it, you're not alone there, Ryan, I, I assure you, because uh, I've faced this problem with some raster data. And when you see like five, 10 maps in the same image, and I'm like, okay, I know this is the same terrain or is the same city, but 
why did you facet stuff? Like what you're trying to show me? Yeah, so you're definitely not alone. Good, good. All right, excellent. It, it, it may be helpful, and I haven't done a lot of these. Um, I'm still very new to all this, but it, there may be some value in, if you think about it, you might have to create four different graphs. First, you filter cylinder by cylinder equals four, and then cylinder equals five, and then cylinder equals six, and then cylinder equals eight. And you would have to do this, you know, once each time for a total of four and then present it that way. So faceting in a way does that filtering for you and splits it out that way if if you did have a use for seeing for seeing those. So anyway. Yeah, that's a good point. I guess like looking at the the chapter on on faceting or the section on faceting where it's like by vehicle class and you can get kind of a quick and dirty overview of like the distribution of each class. Um, but yeah, I guess for any like kind of deeper analysis or, or trying to kind of figure anything out, I think it'd be pretty difficult. Yeah. yeah. Having said that, it usually takes me five or six tries before I get fasting to work right anyway. So, all right, very good. All right, on to different geomes. So part of the purpose of this chapter is also to just see what the different geomes look like. Um, and then I'm sure there will be sections in the future where we actually create, the, create these and get practice with using them and understanding them. But, um, but we'll just go through, I think there's maybe six or seven of them here, and you can at least see them and see how they render in, uh, in ggplot. So um, another one is geome smooth, and that adds this line in, okay? so. If we look at this code right here, this is the basic one that we've looked at already where there's a geome point layer. And then added on top of that is a geome smooth, which is the, uh, the line here. And then there's also some additional arguments that go with this like method. Um, and I think that just has to do with how the line is calculated. SE is the standard error, I think, uh, which says whether this, this gray portion is included or not. You could just have just the blue line. And then there's one here called span, and I don't remember anything about that one, but you can check the help. Um, so that's geom smooth. And then there's also a geom box plot, which generates a box and whisker plot. And then there's uh, this one happens to have out, uh, certain arguments like outlier and coefficient, which adjust the, the whisker length. Okay. So just to contrast it with what we've already been doing, we're using the exact same first line where we, where we create the mapping in the aesthetic. And all we've done here is just change the geome. There's nothing different about the data. Um, it's just the way that it's presented. Um, I should correct that a little bit. They're, they're, we're actually mapping different values here instead of displacement and highway. It's, um, it's uh, drive and highway, but, um, but you get the idea here. You, you, you make those adjustments first, and then you add in the particular geom that you want to see after, okay? There's one called geom jitter and geom violin. Geom jitter is like a box plot, but it allows the, uh, the dots to spread out a little bit better so that um, so they're not overlapping as much. And then there is one called Geom Violin, which does a little bit more of like a distribution, a two-sided distribution. Then there's Geom Histogram, generates a histogram and Geom Frequency Polygon, which generates frequency polygon. So there's arguments here like position and bin width, um, but you know, once again, we're still setting this up roughly the same way and then adding the geome after. One thing I'll point out here is this will always, this always trips me up. So a histogram uh, re only requires one aesthetic, only an X aesthetic, okay? But these other ones, for instance, like the box plot requires an X and a Y aesthetic. And if you're like me, you're going to find yourself adding an X and a Y, and then you're going to try to make it into a histogram and you'll get an error and you'll have to think through it a little bit more about how, uh, what data a histogram actually uses. It has, has no use for an X and a Y um, argument. So you just have to pick one. 
Um, and I guess it works the, the inverse as well too. You might just include one when the geome that you want actually needs an X and a Y dimension. And um, so frequency polygon, polygon is similar to the histogram. It just is more of like a, a line graph sort of approach. A little bit similar. And then geome bar. So uh, the aesthetic here is manufacturer, geome bar. And then, um, and then in this particular case, you can see here that the y-axis is, is count, okay? So I'm gonna take a second to talk for a second about this, this portion, the y-axis here. So geome bar, you can see it only takes in, it only takes one, uh, one argument for the aesthetic and it lay, lays it here on the x-axis. So then the question is, what is it going to actually display? What, are the, what is the height of the bar going to represent? If it only takes in manufacturer, then the height of each bar represents the number of observations, okay? And that's by default. And then, and that's called a stat. So the default stat for geome bar is the number of observations or the count. Okay. Now, what if you don't want to see the, the number of observations, but you want to see like the sum of something like price? What is the price of all of the Dodge, um, all the Dodge vehicles or all the Hyundai vehicles? Okay. So that's different. And now price is not actually part of this data set. So we're going to use, um, we're going to use displacement instead. Okay, because it'll work the same way. You can see, so here's the, here's the actual counts. There's 18 Audis, 19 Chevys. And if you come up to this, you can see that it comes in 18 Audis, 19 Chevys. So, so the default stat for the, for the geome bar is count. Okay. If we want to change that and we actually want to add up the, all the displacements, then you have to change the stat. Okay. So I've added in a Y value displacement and I've added the stat equals identity, okay? Somebody that knows this better than I can talk about why it's stat identity, I don't know, but, but once you've added in the, what you want the Y axis to represent, you can do stat identity and then it will actually be adding up that, the value that way, okay? So let me go down here to the table to illustrate this a little bit more. The, the column here is the sum of displacement and Audi is 45.8. And you can see that here under Audi, it comes to about 45.8. Um, Dodge is 162 and Ford is 113. So Dodge is 162 and then followed by 113. This, this concept took me a little while to understand. So let me see if anybody has any questions about, about it or anybody that wants to, that knows it better wants to, wants to uh, shed, shed some more light on it too. I think it's the, in, the, in your example with the displacement, if you colored that by displacement, you would see that it's actually stacking multiple little bars on top of each other. And that's how it gets, that's how it's adding them up. Um, and the identity is saying, don't do any transformation on the data. Don't do any statistical transformation. Just use it exactly the way it is. Um, actually, you could even just, I think if you just added like a, a fixed color, it would outline each individual little bar in there and you could see that it's actually adding up the displacement for each model. Try to do that on the other screen here. If anybody has any other thoughts in the meantime. So Ken, would it, it, it would be stating the same fact that we're doing like basic arithmetic inside the, the chart itself, right? Or the, the quantity, yeah. it's summing up the identity or, or yeah. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. It's like playing with the, the, the little um, blocks that, that grade school kids use to learn about arithmetic. You're just stacking them up. 
And so in essence, you could say, you could even add another layer to that to color code each one of those blocks so that you can see how they're grouping together to make that overall object. Right. So you can see, actually, if you did, you know, if you just put color equals red or something like that outside of the aesthetic, so it's just outlining each one, that might make it even more clear. And you're gonna need quotes on that, yeah. Oh, no. uh, that didn't work. Maybe it needs to be bigger. Fill equals red will make it all. Huh. Oh. Now I've totally broken it. We're going backwards. Okay. Oh, you're missing a parenthesis after the, yeah, right there. There you go, that shows it. So each color represents a different, a different displacement value. Right. Yeah. So each, each little rectangle is actually one model. Yeah. Find the displacement for that model. And you can see the darker ones are shorter. Well, it seems, at least in some cases, there's probably somewhere in there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe the red uh, color would work inside a geom bar, inside the geom. Uh -huh. But you need to uh, take the other option, the, the field display, just cancel it, and then try to like, Feel uh, um, oh, feel oh, right. red. Yeah, you put the color there in the bar. Yeah. Well, now you have to give it, put that in the AES, or just give it a. I would yeah, basic, it. Basically, if you if you uh, do display displacement, uh, so the variable uh, you need to to use the aesthetic. But otherwise, you can just make like. Feel color, uh, feel red color. Well, I have a question. Yes. Is there a way to sort the colors so like all of the dark of the display will be at the bottom and then it goes to light, like it goes from dark to light each bar? Yes, there's always a way. I don't remember how, I don't remember what it is right now, but yes, and I know that it can be done. Question for me. Yeah. Yeah, I think you'd have to create an ordered factor for the models. Oh yeah. For the maybe I'm. A question I've got about this thing is uh, why it, it colors like it was a continuous variable. Yeah, it's I think it's I think it's because it is a continuous variable. Yeah, displacement is a continuous variable. Yeah, it's a double. So you might have to convert that. Yeah, maybe if you rounded it and then converted an integer to a, a factor if there aren't that many yeah. um, displacement values, but. Yeah. Good questions, anybody else? All right. We'll see. What do we have left here? Um, a couple other, which we saw earlier, um, had to do with line graphs and, there, and geome path, geome line, and geome path. And there's some some interesting arguments there. Line end and arrow in certain cases. Um, and then you can you know you can put them on the same graph as well and. And whatever supports your needs, right, is the kind of the point there. All right. Last couple of things then. Modifying the axes. Okay. So X lab and Y lab allow you to modify the axis labels. Okay. So here it is. Here's a graph with a plot without any 
changes to the um, to the access label city and highway but then you add in an x lab and a y lab and it updates those you can remove them all together with null x lab null and y lab null they're gone then um what we got here well, you can also change the the access boundaries so um i don't know if i put in like a contrasting example here but um oh yeah it comes up so this one you can see that the values for for uh, drv are four f and r and from highway it ranges from maybe like 10 up to 40 but you can put some limits on those and put in the X limb F and R. So then it'll only, it'll only span F and R and you can put the Y limb from 20 to 30 and it'll span just, just that portion. So I haven't ever used these before, but it, it seems like it has a filtering effect or limiting effect on the plot. Okay. So maybe give that a try. And then last of all, um, is the output. So uh, it, one of the things that I think is great about R in general is that um, the variables don't just need to take on objects like numbers or data frames. You can actually assign a plot to a value. So here we've, we've made this plot, assigned it to the value or to the object P, and then you can treat it from there. You can print P and then, then the plot will come out. You can save it to a disk using gg save, save it as plot.png. We're saving the object P, and then you can specify the width and the height. You can also uh, look at it at the structure of it using summary. Okay. And it'll answer, it'll give you information about that object. Okay. Hey Ryan, if you don't mind me expanding on this one section uh, yeah. with the saving option. So I ran into a really odd predicament using another uh, particular code base that, that I'm trying to deploy. And the previous uh, author was using ggsave. It only saves the object. It only saves the plot. I wanted to find out a way of adding uh, additional characteristics, like maybe a uh, title uh, to that particular output and, and then a footer with maybe the rev date and, and some other variable uh, to include. I realized that ggsave as a function is not uh, enough for me to do that. And there were other libraries to access, but then that would affect the entire code base. I wanted to see if anybody else would like to expand on that topic, uh, maybe outside of the, the book club, because I'm actually really curious on being able to use a different output uh, function than just ggsave by itself. From what I know about ggsave, I don't think there are any other options to modify the plot, like the internal code that was used to produce the plot per se. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if this is an option for you, but you could always, I, I did this recently of writing a function that writes a plot, but pulls in some metadata about the particular subset I'm working with and then saves that. And then you can just run, like iterate through that and that might help you, but it doesn't sound like maybe that's exactly what you're. No, what, what, so that's a great statement and, and you're, you're hitting in the right area. So what I realized was that GG save is just uh, focused on the plot itself, whether it be uh, like as a as a object. Uh, when I started to add the uh, headers and footers onto the PDF output, that's where I started to get into a different arena because that's not directly related to the data set that I'm plotting. Or right. actually, it's a calendar output is what I'm dealing with. But uh, using the GG library to create a calendar, I wanted to add a header and footer to the PDF. Those would not like it would be additional services like calling on a variable called title or calling on a variable called footer and then adding some extra data related to that oh, um you know you can again. put a title and a caption on a ggplot right you can yeah well well that's mm -hmm. a good statement but i wanted to keep those separate so that um it was related to the pdf save not the actual plot itself makes sense yeah it seems like you want to get into more of an R markdown environment. Then. Yes, yes. And well, that's that's actually where this kind of got all a little bit screwy. And Ryan, I apologize for bringing this up in the book club, but um, your your save function is actually why I wanted to, to raise this 
question to the team uh, using other features, I suppose. Yeah, that's that's a great question, Ryan, because I, I ran into something like kind of similarly to what you're proposing here, because again, I, I work with maps and I generate like a very good quantity of maps and I had to export them. Like each map has a different title, but it's related to the same subsetting. And I had this problem, like I can, I can export the saving, the plot, but I can change like other titles or maintain the same title, stuff like that. So what I tried to do and it worked for me, I don't know if it would work for you, is like opening a new device, like a PNG device, like a new graphics device before. So you open the device, then you go with the ggplot functions, all that you want to do. And then you like go with a DV off and you close this, this device, this graphic device. So uh, it's a way that I do, it's a function. So the function opens a new graphic device, generates my plot, then it closes the device and exports the plot for me. So maybe that's also a good option. I don't know. That's a good thought. Yep, yep. I'll give that a shot as well. All right. Well, very good. Thanks, everybody. That's uh, all I have. We've only got a, a minute or two left, so let me just uh, hand it back to Priyanka then to close us out. I don't know, Priyanka, if you wanted to um, get a volunteer for next week or, or how you wanted to handle it, but I'll let you wrap it up. And I wanted to thank everybody for your participation and, and for joining today. I don't think. Oh, yes. I oh, did she, did she drop off? I thought she did, but now I see her. Oh, I'm here, but then if you can wrap it up, thank you. Okay. All right. Well, maybe uh, we can get a volunteer in the in the Slack to take on Chapter Three for next week. We can continue the discussion there. Oh, and I actually messaged uh, Priyanka. Uh, I volunteered. Oh, great. Yeah, because Chapter Three is like super short, and since I'm new, I wanted to do like I want to participate, but like yeah, I think doing a really short chapter would be nice to get my feet wet into it yeah perfect that sounds great so you'll handle next week and by all means reach out to anybody uh if, I, I know this is true for anybody in the slack it's a, it's a tremendous community everybody is very helpful so feel free if you need or if anybody needs help along the way reach out and people will be there for you so so uh with that our time is done i wanted to thank everybody and um other than that we will see you on the slack i think Thank you, Ryan. It was a great right. presentation. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks. Thanks. Have a great Thank day. Have a great day. Thanks. Thank you.